Okay, so good evening to you all. My name is Marsha Moore, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Gateway Science Museum to this, the third in our Museum Without Walls Fall Lecture Series. We are so pleased that you can join us for this extended series with a total of seven talks, virtual of course, continuing every Wednesday evening through the end of October. The talks, as you probably know, are listed on the Gateway Science Museum's website, and we hope you can attend them all. And briefly, I wanted to allude to my virtual background. Those of you who attended the past two lectures saw me in front of the outside of our museum. I thought we should be reminded of the beautiful, exciting, science-filled inside, which is just waiting to be able to have visitors once again. Over the next few weeks, I'll share a few more pictures so you don't forget. Before proceeding to tonight's presentation, I want to thank our MWOW committee, our executive director, Adrian McGraw, exhibits curator, Stephanie Parker, and community board member, Dr. Rachel Teasdale. We are extremely appreciative also of all our speakers who are donating their time, talents and knowledge to the furtherance of teaching and learning about science in our region and beyond. We also thank our series sponsors, North State Public Radio Station, Renee and John McCamus and Marsha Moore. And we do acknowledge and are mindful that CSU Chico stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta. And we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. We are humbled that our campus resides on sacred lands that once sustained the Machupta people for centuries. Tonight, we are very pleased to have Cherie Chastain, Sustainability Manager at CSU Chico, who will speak with us on the topic, Climate Action and Resilience Planning at Chico State charting a path to 2030. Cherie has her BA in environmental geography from Sacramento State University and her master's degree in geography from Chico State. <clears throat> Apparently a lifelong learner, she is now working on a second master's degree in political science at Chico State. Prior to her work at the university, she worked for 12 years as sustainability manager at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company where her work included advocacy for climate and energy policy at the state and federal levels, education and training of employees, and working on operational efficiency improvements. And one of her current roles is as chair of the Ch Chico Climate Action Commission. We are delighted to have you share with us this evening, Cherie. First, some minimal housekeeping details. Tonight's lecture, while virtual, is totally live so you will not have to go to another site as we have done for the prior two lectures, which were pre-recorded. We will ask you, or actually we've already muted the audio during and after the lecture, and to write any questions you have for our speaker in the chat column. These questions will be presented to Cherie at the end of her presentation during the Q&A session. So now take it away, Cherie. Wonderful. Thank you, Marcia. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to hope everybody can see that. And thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about climate action and resilience planning at Chico State, give you a little bit of background on where we've been and um, some more information about where we are headed. And then I'll um, conclude with some ways that you can get involved. Um, there are many ways for you to get involved, should you so choose. So um, I'll go ahead and start with the commitment that Chico State has made. Um, and you all can still see my screen, correct? Okay. So Chico State has made uh, what we call the climate commitment. And the climate commitment is actually a twofold commitment. Uh, the climate commitment consists of one commitment to carbon, and this is our carbon neutrality commitment. There's a second commitment for resilience. Um, so campuses can choose an individual carbon commitment or they can choose a resilience commitment. If they choose both, they can choose what's called the climate commitment. Chico State was a founding signatory of the American Colleges and Universities Presidential Climate Commitment. 
2007. So this is a long-standing commitment that the university has had. Uh, we're gaining a bit more steam in the last couple of years and actually making some progress in um, meeting the goals that we have committed to. And I'm going to take a moment and pause here and just remind you that if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat as you have them. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, or you can save your questions to the end. Um, if you don't want to forget them, go ahead and pop them in the chat there. And we have Mike Guzzi on the call here, who is my boss. So if I get stumped, you know, I'll just kick it his direction. Okay, back to Chico State. So we've made this climate commitment, um, which includes the carbon commitment and this resilience commitment. What does this carbon commitment mean? We have committed to be carbon neutral for scopes one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. It's a very short 10 years away from now. Uh, scope one emissions are basically anything that the university uh, controls, owns, and operates. And that's primarily stationary combustion of natural gas in our boilers, our hot water heaters, uh, diesel in our backup generators. Uh, it's mobile combustion in our fleet of vehicles, so the, the campus vehicles. And then agricultural emissions, which include fertilizer applications and the livestock that we have at the university farm. Scope two emissions are the emissions associated with the generation, transmission, and delivery of the purchased electricity that campus is procuring. So all that energy that we are procuring, uh, emissions are associated in that process at every step until it gets to our campus. Traditionally, uh, most campuses set a really aggressive goal for scope one and two emissions with a later date for scope three emissions because scope three is really, really tough. Scope three are, are things that contribute to campus operations, um, but that are out of our direct control. For example, students, faculty, and staff commuting to and from our campus, which happens to be the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions for our campus. Scope three also includes our sponsored travel. So our faculty and staff who take a research trip or who attend a conference or who attend an industry meeting, uh, emissions associated with that travel are lumped in there. And then our solid waste to landfill as well as our wastewater generation all contribute to our greenhouse gas inventory. So there are other sources of greenhouse gas emissions associated with Chico State's operations, but they have historically not been counted or quantified as part of our um, greenhouse gas inventory. And I'll speak a little bit about that um, a little bit later in the presentation. So that's on the carbon side. On the resilience side, what does that mean? Now resilience can mean anything to anybody. And I think everybody has their own personal definition of what resilience means. It could be uh, mental resilience or physical resilience or economic resilience. Um, there's lots of different directions that you can take this word. And so we have adopted second nature's definition of resilience, which is the ability to survive disruption and to anticipate, adapt, and flourish in the face of change. Now, Second Nature is the organization that we report our greenhouse gas emissions to. It is the organization that oversees all of the campus climate commitments, um, which is why we've adopted their definition of resilience for purposes of planning on our campus. So here's a little snapshot of uh, what our greenhouse gas emissions currently look like. You'll see here at the bottom, scope one. This next color is scope two. And then this top bit is scope three. What's very disappointing, I think for myself and, and Mike as well, is that scope one and two are relatively flat. Um, this means that we're not making the investments in our own campus. This means that we're not doing as much as we should with our own physical infrastructure, um, addressing behavior, um, engaging in education and awareness. And so this is, we're gonna do a lot, and I'll talk about that. We're gonna do a lot in these scope one and two areas to kind of step up our game a little bit. Scope three, as I mentioned, is, is a really tricky one um, because it, it's things that are out of our control, which makes it really, really difficult to quantify. So as we're getting data, it's imperfect data. It's not, um, it's not perfect world data, which leaves a lot of holes and gaps. And so we're gonna work to try to fill some of those holes and gaps over the coming years so that we have more robust and strong data. But overall, we are seeing a significant decline in our greenhouse gas emissions from our 1990 baseline. 
but we have a long way to go to get to neutral, right? We still have more than 20,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent um, that we need to somehow eliminate or offset. Hmm. We did have a climate action plan that was written and adopted in 2011, and that was the uh, most recent climate action plan. I'm in the process right now of updating our climate action plan, and I expect to have that out um, and hopefully approved amongst the campus community by the end of the year is our target for that. Um, we should start to see that circulating in smaller groups for review and input in the next um, couple of weeks. But these are some of the initial recommendations that were included as part of the initial climate action plan in 2011. Um, I put check marks next to the ones that have been completed. Uh, there's been some progress on some of the other ones, but um, not enough to actually check off as complete. I'm not going to read these to you. You can read the whole um, climate action plan on the website uh, at a later time if you choose. I also wanted to mention that there was no call out for resilience against climate change in the initial climate action plan. So in 2018, the city of Chico adopted a climate change vulnerability assessment. And the assessment was done by a Civic Spark fellow and the fellow um, evaluated using a tool called CalAdapt to look at what is the city of Chico going to look like in the coming years as the climate continues to change. In that report, um, it identified increasing average temperatures and changes in annual precipitation as two key factors that we're going to face with our climate here in Chico. What those are going to lead to are specifically increased frequency, intensity, and duration of heat days and waves, increased flooding, increased wildfires, and decreased snowpack and water supplies which we've all intimately felt over the last several years, right? From this though, there's a lot more that needs to be considered when you're talking about resilience. So these are the things that we need to prepare for, but these things can also lead to impacts on our physical utilities and infrastructure, um, our food systems and food security, our vulnerable populations, public health. Um, how are we going to have safe streets and transportation exit routes, right? There's a lot more that needs to be considered as the climate continues to change and impact us here in Chico, but globally at the same time. Um, so we've all felt this, right? We've felt all of these impacts already. We had a severe drought from 2013 that eased up in 2017. We're headed into, we're in the middle of another um, drought at the moment. Uh, we had incredible rains that led to the Oroville Dam spillway emergency, which I'm not going to rehash all of these things for you. We also had the car fire, which was incredibly devastating, right on the heels of that, the campfire, which was even more devastating, followed by another supercell downpour that I know Gazi had a lot of fun cleaning up after, millions of dollars of damage on our campus alone followed by public safety power shutoffs, right? As the utilities continue to experience uh, potential wildfire risk associated with their infrastructure with high winds, low humidity, like we've been experiencing again intimately. Oh, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. This pandemic is changing the way that we're thinking about everything. It's changing how we're doing everything. Um, it's also impacting the most vulnerable populations the most, those that have the most exposure to pollution those that are the most impacted by climate change already are hardest hit by this pandemic. Um, and then most of Northern California is still on fire. Um, you know, the effects of climate change are real. They're happening in real time. They're devastating. They're causing destruction for communities across the world, but especially here in Northern California. So in a nutshell, the human world is kind of a mess right now. We'll just get that out. It's, it's devastating. I think it's causing a lot of anxiety. It's causing a lot of angst, but there are solutions and there are actions that we can take. Um, this does not have to be a, an incredibly depressing exercise. Um, so we're gonna shift now away from the devastation and talk about some of the opportunities for action. So at Chico State, um, if you do not if you were not aware, um, our president released her strategic plan about a year ago. Um, within the strategic plan, there are three key strategic priorities, equity, diversity, and inclusion, civic and global engagement, resilient and sustainable systems. 
Following those are the enduring commitments, which are our academic distinction, our transformative student experience, our prominent scholarship and innovation, and a culture of excellence and accountability. So what the president did, um, she announced this plan, and then she identified teams of leads on campus to lead teams for each one of these strategic priorities. So Guzzi and I are part of the team leading the resilient and sustainable systems. Um, we're also leading that with Megan Kurtz out of the president's office and Eli Goodsell, the executive director of the reserves. So we have these teams. From there, the teams were tasked with developing campus-wide goals. And so for our goal of carbon neutrality, um, we, have a, we have a couple goals here. So on the sustainability side, one, we're gonna get this climate action plan done. So we're, I'm working really hard to, to get that climate action plan out there. This is gonna be our roadmap for achieving carbon neutrality. This is gonna be very tactical. This is going to um, put a lot of emphasis on scope one and two, a lot of emphasis on investment needed on campus to make the changes to really draw down our emissions. Um, from there, we're gonna work on quantifying the amount of carbon sequestered in campus soils. So we're gonna measure the amount of carbon sequestered in campus proper, we're gonna measure the university farm, and we're gonna measure the reserves. We're gonna measure all different soil types, um, and then we're gonna work on a plan to optimize the amount of, so amount of carbon that we're sequestering in our soils. So we have a climate action plan, very tactical investments to draw down emissions generation. And then we're going to quantify sequestration and work on improving the amount of carbon that we can sequester on our campus soils. But we are an institution of higher education. Um, so coming back to our mission and our roots of education, we're going to restructure the current Greenleaf course designation. The Greenleaf currently designates broad sustainability focused courses within the course catalog. So a student can easily identify a sustainability focused course. We're gonna restructure that so that it focuses on climate change. Um, so we've narrowed down the student learning outcomes. There's a team of faculty and staff that are working on this. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna refocus this effort on climate change. And then we're gonna work on making sure that every student who graduates from our institution has taken at least one Greenleaf course as part of their education at Chico State. Um, so this is on the, the climate and the sustainability side. On the resilience side, um, we're going to increase the integration of resiliency into research and academic practice, and we're going to do this through faculty engagement workshops. We're going to increase our ability to respond to these natural disasters that continue to hit us um, by making sure that at least 10% of Chico State students have some sort of CPR, first aid, healing center engagement, or trauma-informed care. Um, we're going to develop a strategy for educational continuity, which the pandemic really forced us into, um, but we have some ideas on how to further improve the services that we offer our students in times of this incredible disruption. Uh, and then we're going to improve our coordination with local municipalities on emergency planning and response. And then we're also going to create a resiliency collaborative. And this collaborative will be a space that people can come together to learn from one another, to be inspired by one another, to share information and resources with one another, to really build a resilient region. Um, so facilitating a conversation and resource and information sharing within the North State. So as I mentioned, the Climate Action Plan is being updated. So I'm working on this right now. We're in kind of the final stages of just pulling kind of getting some last numbers around goals, uh, making sure that we've got, we've got our numbers really solidified there. So give you a sneak peek of what, what we're looking at within the Climate Action Plan. First of all, uh, we did contract with faculty member Marie Patterson to write a strategic energy master plan. The strategic energy master plan is a deep, deep dive into specifically natural gas and electricity. And she's done um, you know, a deep dive on our, on our existing usage and kind of where we stand right now, but also recommendations on how to lower or hopefully neutralize emissions from natural gas and electricity specifically. So that's you know, in the climate action plan, we're kind of addressing some of these things at a very high level. And then the strategic energy master plan will be uh, that deeper dive into those specific areas. 
But within scope one, uh, we're talking about what we're calling weaning the steam, which is essentially eliminating or reducing the demand that we're placing on our natural gas fired boilers, the brand new shiny pieces of equipment that we're just invested in. Um, we're going we're gonna to try to wean ourselves off of those over the next 10 years. Looking at better metering, um, you know, Mike Guzzi and I have put forward a zero scope one procurement policy, which requires no more natural gas appliances moving forward. So if a water heater needs to be replaced, um, we're going to look for an electric option, basically. And that procurement policy applies to not just um, natural gas combusting equipment like water heaters, but it also applies to vehicles and uh, yard equipment, so lawnmowers, leaf blowers, because everybody loves the super loud gas guzzling leaf blowers. Um, Sidetrack. Uh, so we're going to electrify our vehicle fleets. We're looking at backup battery power systems that will hopefully create more resilience um, with future power disruptions, but also help us store renewable energy. Um, which we're going to hopefully increase. We're actually in the process right now of adding more solar to campus. We're adding solar to um, obviously the new physical science building, but we're also adding some solar to the BMU, um, to the rec center, and we're gonna finish out that solar array at the top of parking structure too. We're also gonna look at uh, net zero energy construction and major renovations. We're going to look at improving space utilization. Um, so we don't have to run an entire building for say one classroom. Um, or one office. Uh, we're going to look at virtual server migration um, and then addressing behaviors, right? We can make all the financial investments uh, that, that, that we can afford, um, but if the users are not using the systems appropriately or doing their part, it's kind of a, a wasted effort. So we're going to put a lot of energy into education and awareness. So three, as I mentioned, is the hardest one um, because this really gets at people's habits and they don't like to change their habits. Uh, so, you know, scope three, looking at, you know, we've obviously been forced into telecommuting. You know, I've, I've been working from home since March. Most of us have, um, which has a huge impact on our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're going to look at some incentive programs, but at the same time, we're going to work on improving the infrastructure for alternative transportation. So I hear repeatedly that bike theft and vandalism is a huge barrier for people to riding their bikes to campus. So we're gonna look at some secure bike parking. Um, we're gonna do some more education around how to register your bike and then report theft and vandalism, but also how to lock your bike. Um, you know, I've seen some really um, creative ways to not at all lock your bike to a bike rack on campus. So we're gonna do some education there. Um, doing things like working with BCAG to really promote the services and the safety features. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about safety and um, I heard that each V-Line bus has like more than five security cameras on each bus. And I don't think anybody knows that. So you're know, putting some of these features out there that will hopefully break down the barriers that people have to alternative transportation. But also looking at, you know, potentially restricting parking permit sales based on geography. So if you live within a mile of campus, maybe we're not gonna sell you a parking permit. Um, we still need to, to dig a little more into that, into that data and see you know, what impact that truly has. Um, but then you know, maybe restricting first year students from bringing a car to campus. You know, maybe they're not allowed to bring a car to Chico or maybe they have to park it at a remote lot and you know, if they need to go grocery shopping, they can take a shuttle or something to get to their car. Um, and then of course, improving composting and our zero waste efforts to help reduce uh, the scope three emissions associated with landfill contributions. And the composting is gonna be a critical piece in improving our carbon content of our soil. Um, that's some of the work that we're doing right now with faculty member Garrett Lyle is to measure measure the carbon content of the soil over time as we include compost applications as part of our landscaping practices. Um, and then again, kind of bring it back to resilience. So, you know, Second Nature has some strategies to pick from. And so we've picked these four strategies based on the climate change vulnerability assessment that was done for the city of Chico. Uh, so recognizing these are the things that we have to prepare for. 
Um, so we're going to work on improving our stormwater management. We're going to improve our ecosystem management, uh, you know, improving pollinator habitat, increasing native and drought tolerant landscaping, that kind of thing. We're going to work on, we're going to work with the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems on food security and building a more robust and resilient food distribution and storage system. And then increasing access to cooling. So um, developing some sort of plan or strategy around cooling centers or accessibility, hydration stations, um, but also improving the tree camp canopy of our campus to hopefully bring that campus temperature down. And don't forget, we're still going to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. We got this, right, Mike? Yes, hoorah, as you would say. The plan also includes um, some other features, you know, so that it's not just a, a checklist of things to do to achieve carbon neutrality. We have more responsibility as an institution of higher education. Uh, so the plan includes components around expanding um, the climate commitments in curriculum and education research and community outreach. Um, we have a section about offsets and clarifying what qualifies as an offset and what percent we will allow as an offset in our neutrality goal. Um, you know, theoretically, we could buy offsets for 100% of our inventory right now if we have the money. Nobody's got any money right now. Um, but theoretically, we could buy offsets right now. The intent here with this plan is not to excuse necessarily bad behavior by buying offsets, right? We still need to do the work. Um, we have to put in the effort. We have to do our best to get as close to neutral as possible. Should that not be achievable, that chapter puts um, some limitations around offsets and like I said, what's allowable, but also some percentage limits on there. And then of course the big one, how are we gonna pay for it all? Uh, so we've got some ideas on how we can fund some of these recommendations and projects that we're putting forward as part of the plan. So that's the, the update to the climate action plan and where we're headed and what's included. You know, like I said, I expect to see that you know within the next month or two in a much more public format. Um, it'll be circulating through some smaller uh, groups for initial review over the next couple of weeks. So how can you participate? Um, I am assuming a lot of you are here in Chico, um, but even if you're not, there's still ways that you can get involved. If you are in Chico, this is for you. Um, participate in the Campus uh, Sustainability Committee subcommittee. There are 11 subcommittees as part of the Campus Sustainability Committee that covers everything. I know it's unruly, um, 11 is crazy. But <laughs> we have a lot of really passionate, intelligent, um, productive people that are engaging in all of these subcommittees. We're looking for representation from all corners of campus. We're looking for people who can contribute time, expertise, knowledge, um, but also some energy and um, you know, hopefully some ability to actually help us get some of these things done. Um, it can't just be me. <laughs> it can't just be Mike, right? We need a huge team of people mobilizing collectively if we're going to achieve these goals. So this is a great way to get involved. Um, I'll put in the chat when I'm done a link to that website. They, um, it's not updated right now for this coming year, but it's updated with the last year's goals and committee members. So you can see kind of what each one of these committees are working on. We do need participation from our community members. For example, I chair the Alternative Transportation Subcommittee. And, and you know, I have people from the city of Chico on that. I have people from BCAG on there. I have a local transportation planner on there. Um, you know, so we need folks from the community. If you are a campus member, please consider participating in one of these subcommittees. And again, I'll put the link in the chat um, as soon as I'm done. And then for a larger community effort, um, I saw Mark Seaman, I think was on, on the call as well here this evening. Um, he also serves on the Climate Action Commission with me. Um, the Climate Action Commission is a relatively newly formed commission within the city of Chico, uh, not quite a year old yet. Um, I think maybe it's two years. I don't know. Time, is, time is completely warped in this whole COVID situation. 
At any rate, the city has a Climate Action Commission and the Climate Action Commission is in the process right now of updating their Climate Action Plan. Um, so it's really good timing that the city is doing it at the same time as campus because we impact each other so much. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you, the community members, to contribute your thoughts, ideas to the Climate Action Plan. Uh, our next meeting is October 8th which is just next week, it will be a virtual meeting. Um, there is information on the website on how to join that virtual meeting. At that meeting, I believe we'll be talking about some of the initial measures that have been brought forward by the consultant who's working on this project for the city. Um, but there's also a website and in the website at the bottom of the website that I've listed there, the bottom of that website is a survey um, or it's just a like a feedback box and so if you have things that you want to make sure are included in the city of chico please make sure to fill that in there's also going to be some community outreach happening over the next month um, we've got one uh, specific invite only workshop with some key stakeholders um, in the community around electrification so again, weaning ourselves off of natural gas and, and that's happening I think, within the next week. Um, but then beyond that, over mid to mid October through uh, November, we should have a lot of community outreach around that. So keep an eye out for that and engage in that process. You know, add your ideas, add your thoughts, add your feedback. You are part of the city of Chico. This plan should be for you. Um, but again, we need to mobilize collectively as a group if we're going to actually start to, to move the needle and, and achieve some of our goals. So with that, um, there's my contact information. I'll leave that up for a minute if anybody would like to uh, send me an email if you have thoughts afterwards, but I think we'll go ahead and, and open it up for questions, Marcia. So, and I'm not sure if I'm unmuted, but if I am, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. That was very inspiring and very important. Am I being heard? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Marsha. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> and I did come up with a question. Uh, Dr. Rachel Teasdale is monitoring the questions in the <clears throat> chat column. Um, and so I don't know if you've come up with any yet. Yes, we have lots of questions. Lots of questions, we'll start. Okay, great. Right. So um, the one of the early questions that came up um, is about the virtual servers and if the emissions are being transferred somewhere else. And maybe you could address that not just in the context of virtual servers, but maybe some other offsets or um, strategies like that. Excellent question. And yes, the emissions from that are just being located somewhere else. So I do have a section and I, I forgot to talk about that, my apologies, um, but in the climate action plan around the data, um, I do have a section discussing the limitations of our data. So what I shared on the slides today are what campus has historically reported. Um, and so that's you know what our baseline is based on, that's what our goals are based on. However, there are a lot of sources of emissions that contribute to campus operations within that scope three category that have not been quantified. And so we need to grapple over the next year or two with how we're going to deal <clears> with that. Um, and so server virtualization is very specifically one that's called out in there, but other things like emissions associated with our procurement pro process, um, food, our, our food distribution process, distance that it travels um, with uh, paper, right? That's a, you know, we used to use a lot of paper, hopefully now we just, stop using it, wouldn't that be great? Um, but also our buildings, you know, there's, there's a lot of embodied carbon in our buildings with the building materials that we use, with how buildings are demolished or refurbished or redesigned. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we haven't accounted for and we recognize that. And so we are going to have to figure out if we're going to quantify them and how we're going to work those into goals moving forward. Um, hopefully that answers that. That's great, thanks. Okay, so we have another question um, about whether the city, the university, the Chico Unified School District and maybe CARD can move towards using treated wastewater 
for irrigation, um, athletic fields, um, landscaping, those kinds of things. Or maybe we already are, maybe you could mention some about that. We're not in the city of Chico. Um, it's been a topic that's been discussed uh, quite heavily for, I think as long as I've been in Chico, if not longer, and I've been here for 16 years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what, what repeatedly comes back as in, in that exploration process is the location of the wastewater treatment plant and moving that water back upstream to the city of Chico to get it to end use points. Um, when I was at Sierra Nevada, I spent a lot of time, I spent like years on wastewater issues and attempting to use the wastewater from the brewery that was just generated in the brewing process alone no sanitary sewage water, using that on site for irrigation. Um, and, and that, I learned a lot about wastewater. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory restrictions. And as soon as the word waste is put in front of water, red flags and fireworks go off everywhere with every regulatory agency, like ever. <laughs> it's bonkers. Um, so I know it's been discussed a lot within the city of Chico, but um, I do not believe that there are any immediate plans for that to happen. Okay, great. Um, so another question is um, with respect to, uh, you mentioned that there's um, a lot of solar that is being installed. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how much that is, like what proportion of our electricity use is um, going to um, renewable energy types? Uh, not a lot. <laughs> I'll be very upfront with you on that. Uh, so the solar that we're adding, um, I can't remember the exact cable. I thought, oh, I it actually right here. Um, so we're going to be, we have an existing, um, let's see, about 325 kW of solar for those of you who are getting nerdy on this stuff. Um, and we're looking to add another about 662, not about, that's kind of precise, isn't it? Um, 662 kW of solar, which would be on the REC BMU parking structure two and the new physical science building. That new addition is only estimated to be about 5% of the total campus energy use. Uh, and that, I should qualify that with that is when campus is in full swing. Um, you know, right now nobody's there um, we're obviously still using a lot of electricity on campus, but um, it's not going to get us to our goals. I will also add that there are, you know, the state of California continues to pass state level legislation and mandates that continues to force not only renewable energy into the grid mix, um, but, you know, now the governor just signed a week ago eliminating gas powered vehicles in the next 10 or 15 years, you know. Um, so the state does have a lot of um, a lot of push. They've passed legislation requiring 100% renewable power by 2045. So that's 15 years too late for our goal, um, but it's a step. And so there are some phased in steps there. The, the current renewable portfolio standard minimum is I think 35%, and that goes up to um, I think 50% in the next few years. So the, the power that we are buying is slowly being forced into greening itself. Can I, can I comment on that as well? Um, sure. Hey, this is Mike Guzzi. Uh, so, you know, a couple of things that I wanted to comment about this because I think all of you should be like me and be uh, frustrated when you look at our campus and see the lack of the amount of solar, right? It's like, why do we have all these, why can I look at an aerial map of Miriam Library, which is the largest building in Butte County, and it not just be dotted with solar all over the place, right? Um, so I think we've, we've been making a concerted effort over the last year. Um, it's been a little bit frustrating and a slow process working some of these agreements. But I will tell you that um, when I got here three and a half years ago, the arts building was just getting completed. And the arts building has some solar panels on top of it. Um, but it should, um, you know, irritate you and shock you to know that when I got here, that solar wasn't even on, like it wasn't turned on and being used. And so we were all like, what, you know, I remember asking the question, like, how much energy are we getting from that? And then my guys said, oh, we're not getting energy, any, any energy from it. And then turns out that they hadn't even taken the step to go and turn it on. So of course we've corrected that. Um, Cherie's had to work quite a bit to 
work into the fact that they didn't actually go through all the steps to actually get that as part of a PG&E agreement for us to have that solar on our grid. Um, and it, so we're, we're playing a lot of catch up and I'm not trying to make excuses for us, but I think we're making up for a lot of um, stuff that maybe wasn't put in place. And so now our baby step process this past year is exactly what Sheree said. We're gonna jump on the BMU rec. Obviously the new science building needs to be dotted with solar. And then we're gonna finish out the parking structure too. Um, our phase two that we're calling it plan is to then move to the farm. Um, so for those of you, you all know probably that we have an 800 acre farm, 3.2 miles from the campus. So my goal is to then get on a agreement to get solar for the farm that makes the farm new, uh, neutral on its own, right? We should be able to generate as much energy as they use out there. It'll be a little bit of a challenge because some of the outlying pumps and so forth but we're gonna figure it out and work that out. So that'll be phase two. And then our plan is then to come back to campus and do phase three, where we look at some of these old decrepit buildings that we have and you know some of these roofs that we need to upgrade, but like Miriam Library, PAC, Holt, all these large rooftop spaces, we should be able to dot with solar um, and try to start getting an impact. But then <clears throat> as I talk with Sheree and Jason, our energy manager, there is that balance that we're trying to do where the good news is the state is, you know, pushing PG&E to be more and more clean. Um, so at some point, you know, our focus needs to be a balance of not only renewable energy on our own campus, but then also, you know, more and more electrification and off the natural gas because PG&E is being forced. I don't want to say, I guess I should say forced. They're being forced by the state to get more green. And so the more that we can capitalize on them being put in that situation, as well as then have our own renewables, then we become more of a, you know, get us closer to our goals. So sorry, that was a longer answer to the short question, but I, I, I get passionate about that because I'm super irritated because we, we put this process in for solar a year and a half ago, and I'm really irritated that we don't have it yet. But we're getting close. We're finalizing the, the last little tidbits and you should see some progress soon. And so I, I look forward to being able to report to you all soon that there's solar going up on these buildings. That's great news, Mike. And um, you know, we're in our 10th anniversary with the museum and we fought to try to get solar on the museum roof and that didn't happen. And that shows you just, you know, how far we've come in solar energy. I mean, it was just, you know, not a possibility 10 years ago and now, you know, we see such a vision for it. So that's awesome. And please do keep Gateway in mind. We would love to um, have solar and somehow be able to help people learn about solar at the museum. So keep us in Yeah, mind. absolutely. And I, I see, can, can, I, can I answer a couple other questions? Yeah, I yeah, please do. I, I was going to get to them, especially the farm question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's where you were going, but, but we'll make sure we come back to that. Go ahead, please. Well, well that one in the library. Right. So, the, so the farm, though, you're exactly right. So I think your, your point there is two things. We are going to look for the farm for two things. Like Cherie is working hard with Cindy Daly at the farm to figure out the um, offsets that can be garnered from our farm. You know, our farm is awesome. And Cindy Daly and that regenerative ag team are doing great things in partnership with the um, College of Agriculture out there. So that's going to be a huge way that we can show that we are offsetting our carbon load um, via our own natural resources that we have. Not only that, but then she's partnering with the BSER, the folks up at the Butte Creek Ecological Reserve, or Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve, excuse me, um, with Eli Goodsell. And then our campus Arboretum is another huge place that we can look for um, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere that can contribute to our offset. Um, and then the other thing, like I answered before, my goal is in the next couple of years, the, the, the farm should be um, net, you know, sticking back into the grid because we have worked with Dave Daly at the farm, who's the farm manager on locations that he said, hey, absolutely stick solar all over this place. Um, so we have a plan moving forward to do that. Um, he didn't, guess, he didn't like say said, that. He oh, didn't ahead, sure. say that. He gave, he gave us some areas where we're drawing the boundaries of the sandbox right now. Yeah. <laughs> Just to be yeah, clear, right. it is a farm. We still have to farm. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's right. And he's been very, you know, that is some of the best farmland in California. And so 
we obviously can't um, impede on some of that great agricultural land, but I think there is some dead space out there that we can use. So we're, we're capitalizing on that. So um, hopefully that answers SIP guy's question. And then the, the other one I want to bring up was the library. You're absolutely right. Um, not only the library, but the entire campus. We burn way too many lights. And as a matter of fact, I just walked around. I took my two directors yesterday on a walk around campus. And all I did was point out, why is that light on? Why is that light on? Why is that light on? Midday. You know, we're in midday and I was walking around Laxon Auditorium. And all the lights on the exterior are on. And I'm thinking, why in the heck don't we have those lights off? And so... Um, he was diligently taking notes and I will follow up with him in about a week to say, okay, did we go and reset the timers for those lights? And then the, the, the library is especially irritating. There are two floors of the library that we actually cannot at this time, and this is embarrassing as the facilities guy to say, but I cannot turn off the lights to the second and third floor in the library right now. Um, I mean, other than pulling the full plug on the entire floor. So, uh, we had, we did, um, out of our budget last year, we funded a study with an electrical engineering firm to go in through and do a thorough assessment of the entire library because, um, you know, I want to tackle the big objects first, right? The library is a huge object. Like I guess it's the largest building in Butte County. Um, so if I can start there with energy efficiency projects for lighting, that'll be a huge step toward getting us there. So we have now identified what we need to do to put into it. And now I just need to um, get the funding to support doing those upgrades to go change the switches, put all those places on occupancy sensors, um, change out all the lights to much more efficient lighting and so forth. Of course, I had that all planned, ready to go. And then like March 5th, we all went into lockdown and budgets got you know pulled back and everything. Um, I'm not going to use that as an excuse. We're going to keep pushing this forward. Um, so we'll get there soon. And we have at least now identified specifically the problem and I have a full quantifiable number towards the solution. So um, I think we're, we're making good progress and just, you know, rest assured the library is like the number one place I want to hit for lights because you know, right now all of us could go walk through the third floor and miraculously all the lights are on. And you're like, why is this happening? Why are we not fixing this? So we've got work to do on it. Another topic that came up is our place in the CSU. What are other CSU campuses doing? What can we learn from them and what can they learn from us? Yes, um, there are, there's a group, an affinity group. So within the CSU system, there's lots of affinity groups, but there's one for sustainability officers. And so the sustainability officers meet monthly and um, we're constantly checking in with one another uh, you know, learning from one another, sharing best practices with one another. And so there's a really robust group of CSUs that, that work together and collaborate on these things. In fact, that was something that I actually just pasted in the chat for you guys is an event that um, uh, I think there's about 12 CSUs that ended up partnering to put on this climate justice equals social justice event. It's a two part series coming up uh, next Monday and then the following October 14th. So, you know, there are a couple different measurements that, you know, if we really wanted to get nuts and bolts and compare which CSU is better, which I don't particularly like to do, but- um, No, you should though. We're there's worried. a competitiveness that, you know, <laughs> bubbles up um, because the, there's, no matter where they are, as long as they're doing that, no, I won't get the soapbox done. So uh, there's something called the STARS, which is the sustainability tracking and rating this is really tracking and rating, I think, system. Yeah. yeah. And so that's offered by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And it's a really, really beast, deep dive into basically a report card for every institution. And so anybody who's reporting their STARS report, there's dozens of credits that you run through everything from your academic performance, your research performance, your operations engagement, um, procurement, you know, there's a whole bunch of categories and you submit your information on what's happening in your institution. And then AISHE gives you a score. We were the highest scoring CSU in the system the last time we submitted our report, which was February, 2018. 
Um, so we were the highest scoring CSU. Um, Northridge did submit a report like six months after us and they beat us by like half a point. Um, so we're gunning for them. Um, our STARS report is due, you know, next spring. And so we're, we're working hard right now to collect as much information as we can um, because we do want Chico to continue to be that leader in sustainability. And STARS is a, is a way to benchmark ourselves against other institutions. There's a lot of things not included in the STARS report that I think um, indicate performance, you know, like carbon neutrality and, and some of these resilience goals that we've been talking about. Uh, but STARS is the best benchmark tool out there and Chico State does perform very well in the STARS report. Great, thanks. That's, that's a, it's good for us to be a little bit hungry to chase down nerve <laughs> That's great. Let's, let's bring the competition on and everybody will win, right? <laughs> Um, so exactly. another another point that's come up is um, you talked a lot about the wonderful things that we're doing in terms of facilities at Chico State and also mentioned that, um, you know, changing habits is much harder. Um, I guess this is a two part question. Um, what impact could the um, residents of Chico State, the students and the faculty and the staff, um, what impact could we have compared to the facilities um, measures that are being taken? And um, how do we get that going? Um, I'm, you know, obviously I haven't been on campus for a while, but, um, you know, I anecdotally hear these great things that we're doing, but I don't hear a strong charge for how I should make a, make a simple change that will have a big impact, you know? So, so how do you get me competitive, competitively involved in this? I mean, I would almost flip that back. How do I get you competitively involved in this? <laughs> you know, um, I think uh, the individual actions, the decisions that people make and the actions that they take, um, that is, um, is so important. Um, you know, we can make the facilities investments, we can put LED lights everywhere, we can put solar on, but if everybody's coming in and just leaving lights on or not caring if that water is dripping or, you know, driving your car and, you know, like it, at the end of the day, it comes down to individual decisions. And so, um, you know, there's, there's carrot and stick approaches and different approaches work for different people. And, you know, what I'm finding is um, among faculty, they do not like to be told what to do. And so um, ha like, presenting this information in a way that's not, you have to do this more, you know, hey, what do you think about this? And so it's, it's a lot of approach. It's a lot of balance. Um, you know, I'm open to suggestions. I am open to any advice that anybody has to engage um, faculty. I think staff is a bit easier to engage. Um, you know, and I've only, I haven't even been on campus for two years yet. Uh, December is two years for me. So I'm still learning, you know, who does what. And this is a very different environment than the environment that I came from. Um, so I'm still kind of feeling things out. So if you all have ideas on how to spark that competitive nature that I know is buried in there, please tell me. Hey, Ra Rachel, I'll comment yes, about something that uh, Cherie yeah. is championing uh, within the side. Uh, again, just to put a plug in for that uh, campus sustainability committee that we'd love to have, you know, as much participation as possible on. But uh, Cherie's leading like the uh, the transportation um, subcommittee on that group. And one of the things that we're looking at is back in, I think it was 20, 2009 or 2011, one of those times, we did a transportation demand management study on the campus. And we came up with all these great ideas of things that we should do as a campus to help limit our impact from transportation on the downtown area of Chico, as well as, of course, the campus and our environmental concerns. Um, so one of the things that I think uh, is this year is we're right to do, and we've been posturing, uh, posturing is probably sounds negative, but I'm positioning for or planning for is uh, Cherie worked with the um, foundation folks last year, I guess Chico State Enterprises and others on campus to we mapped out the where everybody lives on campus, students, faculty, and staff. So we created these rings because we want to look at where people live. Because back in 2005 or six, when they did a study, 
80% of our students lived within two miles of campus. Mm -hmm. um, we did this study last year, and I think, what's the number, Sheree? It's like 60% or something right now live within two miles or something like that, right? So what we're going to position to put forward this year is tiered parking passes. Uh, so basically, if you live, faculty, staff, student, within a mile of campus, I'm going to put forward a recommendation to Academic Senate to say, those people do not get a parking pass, right? They're not allowed. Um, now, is that gonna be a welcome? I, I don't know if this is gonna be a welcome proposition. I'm sure I'm getting a lot of pushback and there's gonna be everybody that gives me the why reasons ADA and all these other accommodations need to happen. But you know, think about if we can just put forth that simple measure. If I can say, if you live within one mile, no driving to camp or you don't get a parking pass. And then if you live within two miles, you pay maybe a higher fee for a parking or something like that, then maybe that would encourage many more people to start using um, our alternative transportation methods, which we should be able to do. You know, I have, I teach one class on campus and I talk to my students about this one time jokingly. And one guy admitted to me, he says he spends like 30 to 45 minutes looking for a parking spot on our campus since we have such limited parking. And he lives like 1.2 miles away. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, bro, like, do you not, you're not calculating that you could have walked to your class in a much shorter time? And he's like, yeah, but that would suck. You know, I just hunt and peck and I'm trying to find my parking spot. So I guess my point is that uh, Cherie is really trying to push forward this uh, concept. And I think it's really, if you think about it in the grand scheme, it's a small step, but it would go a long ways towards starting to make some impact and really change people's mindset on alternative transportation, which like Cherie points out to me all the time, her and Jason from my team, you know, I've got all these great goals and this money that I'm going to put forward. I'm trying to get to support scope one and scope two, but in truth, those are the easy ones, right? It's that scope three, as you saw on that chart she showed earlier, that's the biggest impact. And what's that from? That's from me driving to campus. That's from others driving to campus. You know, we need to fix that. And then we can really start making some real progress. That's great, yeah. And um, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the chat because there are some suggestions there that, um, that seem really great. One of which is really letting us on campus and in the community know about these great works that, that Chico State is doing institutionally as well as um, when we have successes um, uh, with engaging the, the faculty, staff, and students in participating as well. So it looks like we're about out of time, but I think Mark wanted to um, say something and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Mark, take it away. Uh, yeah, first of all, I just wanna thank Cherie and Mike for doing all the hard work that they're doing. They really are doing uh, amazing things. <clears throat> but I, I wanted to push back a little bit on this individual. Uh, what can we do as individuals thinking about our own emissions? I think it's more important for us as individuals to push and demand for even more. Um, I, I want to just point out a real simple thing. Um, Sharia is doing great, amazing things. The university just spent millions of dollars on a master plan, but they aren't spending the same amount on a climate action plan, right? They're asking Sharia and Mike to come up with this plan in which we've, we hired dozens of people. We had all of these charrettes. We did all of this stuff. So I always say, you know, people say, you know, don't tell me what your values are. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And I think what we need to do is demand that the university demand that the chancellor put more money into this than growing the campus even bigger. And so I, I want to say what Sheree and Mike are doing are great. I don't want this to be at all seen as a critique of the work that they're done. They, the fact that we are as far as we are is because they have picked it up and carried it as far as they have. And I, I want to recognize that the, Mike is very kind to not criticize the previous administration that they're having to, to now wean from as they're weaning the steam, right? Yeah. They're doing great stuff, but I think all of us, they can't demand this. They can't go to their boss and say, give me more money. I mean, they could please, but we could demand. There's more money put into climate action. There is more money put into these types of things um, because we're not gonna be able to do it just piecemeal the way it is. So I'll get off my little soapbox, but. I, I'm sorry, as I was sitting here passively, just going, I, I can't let that one stand. No, I, we I, need to demand more of our administration, our government, and the people funding the institution. Yeah, it, you know, one thing, just Mark, I will say that I heard some very positive on last week on this is at the university budget committee meeting, 
So the president's office has, even in this time of um, hard economic stuff, they've carved out 2 million bucks from the budget of the campus uh, towards um, projects that are in support of the strategic plan initiatives that they're gonna then broadcast to us or broadcast. They're gonna send out to us ways to submit to use to get that money. And I know it's only a small step, but it's 2 million bucks a year and it's supposed to be every year. And so those three priorities that Sheree showed earlier, you know, the EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, sustainability and re, uh, resiliency, and then civic engagement. Any of us that can come up with good ideas, projects, whether it be investments in this or true projects like that I would put in place, we're going to apply for those via those fundings. And so, for example, I lost funding this last year due to COVID to improve the bike path on campus to finish it out. But we're primed and I've already told the president, as soon as she releases to me that plan for how to submit for that money, I'm dropping in my plan for that bike path on campus because uh, I want to finish it out. And so I plan to get that funded that way. Um, so it's a, it's a small step, but it's a step, you know, there's some funding starting to get where their mouth is. Hey, hoorah. I'm glad you got it. And we're going to get you 4 million. By putting That's right. Pressure. I'm in. Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> I just wanted to say that when Mike talked about Thank being ir irritated, we love it when you get irritated because you get things done. <laughs> And you okay. really are a great team. So, yeah. Um, but I think, no, I, yeah, I, I, and I just wanted to say real quick I mean, I do, like Mark said, I mean, the, the amazing thing that has been awesome is, you know, I've been pulled in a thousand directions on this campus, but um, I, I think the best thing I've done so far since I've been on campus is hiring Cherie uh, because she's really been taking things to a whole new level. Um, and it's really awesome to know that all these things are getting done. Because I mean, I would, I think you can tell by my just talking, I would love to sit here with her and plan out everything we could do for sustainability, but unfortunately I get pulled in other directions. Uh, but it's, it's so easy just to know, oh, she's got this running. And so it's really neat. That's why I couldn't miss coming in tonight, even though, you know, there's all kinds of playoff games going on and everything right now, Sheree, that I, you know, I had planned to watch, but I love to come and listen to her talk because I always learn something every time I hear her talk about this stuff. So it's really great. Well, I think you've given us a challenge to have your back too. So I, I think that's important. So Adrian, did you have a few things to say before we close? Just wanted to once again, uh, thank Cherie and um, just really appreciate everything that you've uh, shared with us tonight. And thanks to everyone for coming. Um, we are uh, currently closed, but if you wanna keep having more of these great talks, um, we would love to have your donation. So I'm making my final plea for a little, uh, a little cash. So thank you very much. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. With Roger Letterer and Carol Burr. So we'll see you then. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.